Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart find favor in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. I recently heard an old story about a man in Phoenix who called his son in New York. And he said, son, I'm sorry to ruin your day, but your mother and I are getting a divorce. Forty-five years of misery is simply too much. We can't stand the sight of each other. I can't go on another day. I can't even talk about it anymore. So call your sister in Chicago and tell her. The son called his sister in Chicago, told her what their father had said, and she flipped out. She immediately called their father in Phoenix, and before he could even speak, she began screaming at him. What do you think you were doing? What made you get to this point? Do not do anything. Do you hear me? I'm coming there tomorrow, and so is my brother. Don't do anything until we get there. And she slammed the phone down. The man in Phoenix calmly put his phone down and said, Honey, the children are coming home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> They'll be here tomorrow, and they're paying their own way. <laughs> you know, there are some things that just push our buttons. And when our buttons get pushed, we can get reactive very quickly. Typically that button has something to do with our fear. A fear that we are not going to get something that we wanted or that something bad is lurking just around the corner. And when those buttons are pushed, we can become paralyzed, lose our ability to think or be creative, and we typically close ourselves off from other people. Now, if this is a big thing and we're angry, we're likely to lash out at somebody or something. But if it's a smaller thing, we're likely to swallow our anger and let it fester into resentment. And it is just this, I think, that Paul was worried about when he wrote the letter to the Philippians festering resentment. Paul, you may realize, was in prison, probably in Ephesus, probably around the year 55. The community at Philippi had heard about his imprisonment and sent a messenger to him with money. The kind of prison that Paul was in, if you didn't have family or friends to take care of you, bring you food and water, then you did not eat, and you did not drink. But the messenger was delayed. In making the long trip from Philippi to Ephesus, he apparently fell sick. And so Paul writes this letter to the community in Philippi, saying first, thank you, and don't worry about the delay. The messenger simply got sick. He didn't steal your money. But then he quickly goes to a conflict that he has heard about in the community. And it's not just any conflict, it's a falling out that two of the women, founders of the community, leaders of the community in its present day, are having with each other. And Paul is sensitive to this struggle. Festering resentment is bad enough when you're trying to form a community. And if Paul knew this, of course, because there were endless examples in Corinth of what will happen. But he is worried, I think, that this resentment not last too long. And so he encourages members of the community to put on the mind of Christ. Let the mind of Christ be in you. Believing that 
this way of being, notice he didn't tell them what to think as much as he told them how to think. That this way of being would be transformational, that their experience of it would allow them to come together in community. And then he concludes by saying, rejoice always. And again, I will say rejoice, knowing that this transformational experience will be their blessing. Now, when Paul is talking about joy, I don't think he's talking about don't worry, be happy. I don't think he's asking members of the community to ignore suffering in front of them or turn a blind eye to injustice. I think he's talking about something deeper. When Paul talks about joy, I think Paul is talking about the knowledge that we are loved by God, even in tough times. It's not about forgetting about injustice. It's not about turning a blind eye to suffering. It's not even about happiness. It's about a deep, intuitive trust that life is on your side, even when you're facing death. Life is on your side, even when you are facing death. But that still leaves me wondering, So, how do you get this joy? How does that happen? One of my spiritual heroes, Henri Nouwen, says that the root of joy is gratitude. Sometimes we think it's joy that gives rise to gratitude, but Nouwen says, no, it's gratitude that gives rise to joy. And gratitude is, at its core, a discipline, a looking for and finding the presence of God in our lives that reminds us that our very life is a gift and opens our heart to others. Now, and gives a vivid illustration of this as he recounts an experience he had of watching a sculptor work on a large block of rough stone. As the sculptor began to chip away at the stone, Nowen began to empathize with the stone and wonder why the sculptor was inflicting this suffering on this object. And then as he continued to watch, he watched a dancer emerge from the stone with each chip, each crack, each hammer. He could see more and more of the dancer. And now when then made an analogy between the movement from resentment to gratitude and the emergence of the dancer. It is, he said, as if I have lived my life in the discipline of gratitude, chipping away all of those stones that I have used to build a wall around my heart. All of those little indignities and sufferings and petty jealousies that I have used to wall myself off from other people. And gradually I could feel a dancer emerge. And gradually I could feel that dance occur. And then I could feel real gratitude. Then I could feel that I was loved by God even when times were tough. Now today is the third Sunday of Advent. It is a a Sunday that some of us call Gaudete Sermon. That is my somewhat rough attempt to pronounce a Latin term, which comes from an antiphon often sung on this day. You might know it as that Sunday with the pink or rose-colored candle in your Advent wreath. In ancient practice, it was intended to be a break, a light, lighter moment in the penance of Advent. But I invite you this week, if you are lighting that rose-colored candle or otherwise in your prayers, to take a moment to close your eyes and try to remember something for which you are thankful 
some sign that life is on your side, even if in that moment it felt like you were facing death. And as you sit with that memory, that feeling of thanks, as it emerges out of you and literally forces you to give it voice, you will, I think, have a sense of God's presence. And you will be a little bit closer to becoming that dancer. Moving from resentment to gratitude can leave us dancing. The 13th century mystic Meister Eckert said, if you can say thank you and that's the only prayer you know, it will suffice. Loosely translated, if you can say thank you, you're good. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Amen.